delivered. Offers for business customers only. Finance provided by way of higher purchase agreement from Volkswagen Financial Services Ireland. Subject to lending criteria. Terms and conditions apply. Volkswagen Financial Services Ireland Limited is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. Visit volkswagenvans.ie for further information. Football on off the ball. With Sky. Liverpool face Bournemouth in the 3pm kickoff this Saturday. Live only on Premier Sports. Yeah, welcome back to Thursday Night's Off the Ball. Richie McCormick looking over here uh, with you tonight until 10pm. Just to bring you up to speed, uh, 16 and a half minutes to go at Tallis Stadium. Still Shamrock Rovers nil, Ferenc Varos nil and the Hungarian champions leading 4-0 on aggregate. And they will go through to the group stage of the Europa League and Rovers will be in the group stage draw tomorrow for the Conference League group stage. There's a shot just blazing over the bar for Ferenc Varos in the past couple of seconds as well. The likes of West Ham and Fiorentina could possibly await them. Delighted to say, though, I'm joined on the line right now by former Republic of Ireland winger Keith Tracy. Keith, good evening to you. Richie, how are you? Not too bad. Come here, I know you were on uh, duty with Dave McIntyre last night for that Rangers game away to PSV, so you kind of have decent insight after the Champions League draw was made today for what possibly awaits Liverpool in the group stage of the Champions League. It was one of the standout fixtures, I guess, that we got earlier on from uh, Istanbul and that Champions League draw. What did you make of Rangers last night and the possible threat they can pose to Jurgen Klopp's side? Uh, I don't think they'll they'll pose too much trouble in Anfield. I think in Ibrox there may be a, a different a different outcome. They might be a little bit more up for it there. But I think Rangers did well. They defended very well. I don't want to take away from their performance. Cold Colac up front was really really good. But I think the whole the whole game changed when Luke De Jong Luke De Jong got a got a knock at half time and come off and you could see. With the way he was occupying the two uh, the two centre halves or Rangers, that Gakpo was coming into the game because he Luke De Jong was occupying the two of them, so Gakpo was coming in as well. And Tavernier didn't know whether to stick or twist, and he was just causing all sorts of problems. But as soon as uh, as soon as De Jong went off, Rangers really started to grow into it, started to have more and more chances, and that focal point up front that PSV needed. They just didn't have, and they brought on Javi Simone, which is a is a really really decent young player, but he's, he's you know, the chalk and cheese, him and Luke De Jong are very different players. A young young player still trying to find his way to, to Luke De Jong, obviously knows his way to, to goal. So I think it really did. There was so, so little in the game and I, I think it all hinged on that. But look, Rangers were brilliant. They they still had to go there and win and they managed to do that, which is not easy. It's easier said than done, uh, especially over there. Yeah, it's an interesting looking group, right? With Ajax and Napoli also joining the fray there. We were talking about this during the news around earlier, Keith, about Celtic straw. They can look at that Group F and Real Madrid aside can definitely assume that it's navigable because they've got Orbi Leipzig in there they've got Shakhtar Donetsk in there who are obviously going through issues related to what's going on back in Ukraine uh, will have to more than likely play their home games in Poland that's a you know third place is obviously what Celtic will you know be aiming for realistically but getting second in that group isn't beyond the realms of possibility yeah it's not beyond the realms of possibility I think if you take Madrid aside I think Celtic will fancy their, fancy their chances, especially at home. So, you know, I, th- I think home form will be will be the, what decides where Celtic go, whether they keep going in the Champions League or they drop to the to the one below. But listen, it's just great to have them sort of fixtures back. I know Celtic are in the Champions League, Rangers are in two Scottish teams. It just keeps the interest up from a from an Irish point of view as well. And it's just some glamour games, isn't there? Rangers v Liverpool, Celtic v Real Madrid. It's just great to have them all back. However, I, I don't expect Rangers to progress in the Champions League. I don't particularly uh, expect Celtic to progress in the Champions League. But we've got some glamour toys and hopefully the Scottish League can keep getting that little bit stronger and you know they can uh, they can start to compete on the Champions League front. Any sticky groups from your perspective for, for the Premier League sides? Spurs kind of jumps out at me there and, and I kind of have an inkling that Chelsea might have a couple of wobbles still left in them judging by their performance against Leeds on Saturday. Yeah, well, the Chelsea Chelsea does worry me. I I think uh, I think Manchester City's group is straightforward. They've produced the Dortmund. I think Haaland will enjoy going back there, just to going back to his own stomping ground. So, I do. I expect City to get through. I expect Spurs. Uh, sorry, not Spurs. Uh, Chelsea. I'm not. I'm not too sure. Some of the stuff that Tuchel said on the weekend as well after the Chelsea uh, after the Leeds defeat. I I think they ran about twelve k less than Leeds did and. That for me is a non-negotiable. When you're going to a game away from home against the team that you're better than on paper, you've got to walk as hard as them because the only way that that team will beat you if you're more talented is if you don't walk as hard. And mm. for Thomas Tuttle to be saying, 
oh well that didn't mean that and it was it was football based and I know listen Leeds played good football I'm not putting it down to the running but if you've got that if that's on your on your sheet on a Monday morning that the the opposition ran more than you it's the first part of the call so and you see when you, when you see what uh, what Conte has done at Spurs he's just got the lads running he's got them fit and obviously there's an awful lot of talent in there but he's, he's just seemed to give them some desire and I think Tootle needs to inject a bit of that into Chelsea at the minute. Otherwise, like you, Lichy, I think they could have a little bit of a wobble. Yeah, that group does look um, kind of tricky. You know, they've got AC Milan in there, obviously Italian champions. Salzburg have been known to cause people problems in the past. Liverpool can probably attest to that. And Dino Zagreb in there as well. The, the Tuchel stuff is odd, Keith, this season because transfer-wise, Chelsea have seemed a little bit all over the map. The Sterling transfer is one that they obviously pursued and to a degree that makes sense with Werner going out it's almost a like for like Koulibaly I think the yellow the two yellow cards against Leeds last weekend are born out of the fact that he looked a bit uncomfortable playing on the left side of a three and you still see them chasing players that I'm not quite sure where they would fit into this current Chelsea setup so you add that into Tuchel's comments about you know them being at a disadvantage because they had to go by coach instead of playing and all this kind of stuff up to Leeds the mute music coming out of there isn't exactly harmonious at the moment. No, and especially with the with the transfers, it does seem to be a little bit reactive instead of proactive. You know, there seems to be you know they're going for X, Y, or Z, and then it's falling through. Like you know, you were going for the uh, Frankie De Jong, and then all of a sudden it looks like Chelsea were going to come in and nick him. And they just seem to be bouncing around. It doesn't seem to be any great tall behind it. But I do think. The new the new owner Todd Bowley is trying to get the Chelsea fans on side. Hence the Sterling sign and the Kukurea sign. And I think Kukurea is obviously going to be an excellent sign. And he he done really well at Brighton last year. But Kula Bali, I have to say, I do think he will be a good signer. But he, he looks so uncomfortable against the the little man Aronson for for Leeds. Yeah. He looks to be a real player. So just looked a little bit uncomfortable when he had you know a short a small mobile player in around his feet. Kula Bali did not look comfortable. Probably a little bit happier with the physical battle, but. I do expect Chelsea to be okay. And to be honest, look, I think Liverpool and City are one and two. So I think everybody else is in a race for Tord and, you know, so on and so forth. So the glass ceiling for Chelsea and Spurs this season, I think, could be Tord. Yeah, or even indeed success in Europe, uh, depending on what oh, way that yeah. might come as well. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you about City as well, because they had a bit of a, a stumble, 3 1 down at one point against um, Newcastle on Sunday afternoon and came back to draw 3 3. They looked susceptible in midfields in a way that I don't think I'd seen them before. And particularly, added to that as well, Kyle Walker looked to be terrified any time Alan Sam Maximan ran at him. Like, that position is one you know well, Sam Maximan's, and he seems to have nailed it. it. Like, there was a point in the second half where his eff- effectivity, I guess you could say, wore off to a degree. But Kyle Walker, for a time, was having a woeful time against him on Sunday afternoon. Yeah, look, I I played with Coyle at the at the start of his career. We were at Sheffield United together just before he got the got the move to Spurs. And Coyle is a, is an outstanding player. He's very he's this new generation of of right back or right wing back, just like Kieran Trippier, Reese James. They're all very very good going forward. Trent Alexander Arnold. They're all brilliant going forward. But when you get them running towards their own goal, backing off, and especially if you like Kyle Walker's main attribute is his pace. Yeah. He's not he's not the most thoughtful, he's not the the most technically gifted. But if you go past him, he he has the pace to recover. Not against Alan St. Maximin. If he goes past you, you're not recovering. And St. Maximin knew this. If you're up against, the one thing that that wingers and, and defenders hate is pace. Because it's it's so so hard to defend against pace because all you've got to do is knock a pass the boy if there's if there's if there's grass in behind and we all know how Manchester City play trying to squeeze you with the possession and turn the screw when you if you do win the ball against them they are wide wide open so the ball to Saint Maxim and getting in a foot race with Kyle Walker you can understand why Kyle would be terrified because he's so electric and the hard thing about Alan Saint Maxim is. I don't think even he knows what he's going to do when he gets the ball. So how Kyle Walker can know what he's going to do when he gets the ball is is really, really difficult. But look, I enjoyed the game. I thought it was excellent. I think yeah. Pep Guardiola's interview was excellent after when he said, you know, don't worry about the draw. Did you enjoy the game? Is that not enough? Because, you know, I, I've been in, in dressing rooms with Eddie Howe before and I, I did think in the time when he came into Burnley, he was 33, I did think he was a little bit naive because he would go toe-to-toe with anybody, you know, even when we play teams in the Premier League and in, in, in cup competitions, he would go toe-to-toe with anybody. And I did think it was a bit naive, but with this Newcastle squad, he seems to be, he seems to got everybody right on side. And when the Geordies get, get St. James is bouncing, even, even teams like Manchester City will struggle there. So 
I think Newcastle are on the up. I think they're going to be great. But City, you know, I, I think it's a draw, but I think a lot of big teams will uh, will struggle to go to St. James's this year. The how thing is interesting. Like the age at which he started and was like you can start being a coach at a kind of any age, I guess, but being in charge of, of league teams, football league teams at the age that he was in his early thirties at thirty three, was it difficult for certain elements of a dressing room to kind of accept that somebody at that age was their manager, or was that a non issue? Was it just an experience thing or how was how was he received when you were up early at that stage? Yeah, his, his age was definitely an issue, an issue, Richie, at the start, I have to be honest. And it, it was little things, you know. It, it, I, I can give you, you know, examples of, of things that players didn't like. And it will just seem like, you know, total nothingness. How how could somebody get offended by that? And it, it's, football is a totally different world. And, you know, Eddie Howe was, I think he was 33 when he got the Burnley job. And I don't think he was the best man manager in the world. He definitely wasn't the best man manager in the world with me. But there was players that were... You know the likes of Dean Marnie, uh, Michael Duff, players that were a little bit older older than me. I think they were in around the same age as Eddie Hill, but Eddie would call them son and and stuff like that. It, ju- it just didn't go down well with the older lads. And I know in, in the real world, you know that that's nothing. But it just started to grate on players, and everything was play out from the back. We you know we had uh, we had Lee Grant in goal and. He wouldn't be comfortable passing out in the back at certain times, so he would go long, and Eddie would be shouting on to play. And we ended up with just little disjoints in the team. Half the boys that were a little bit braver would would be trying to force the play, and other boys that were a little bit shyer and tough more would be trying to come away from it. So he never quite got everybody on the same on the same way of thinking. But look, I, I think with Newcastle, like I say, with when when you get the Geordies on side, which with some of the signings, two hundred million and two transfer windows. If you can't get people on side with that, then I don't think you ever will. They've kind of spent it sensibly, though. You look at Nick Pope, for instance, who didn't cost the earth and was probably the player of the match despite it being a 3-3 draw last Sunday. That looks like an astute signing. Trippier, for all he gave, adds going forward. I think there's an element of leadership there as well that was on show on, on Sunday too that he brings to the side that was you know, maybe possibly lacking under previous managers or even possibly under Howe when he first arrived there. They've been kind of sensible signings and almost Isaac now coming in for 70 odd million seems like the outlier because it's big money, it's big you know reputation, but still would err on the side of it being potential rather than being a proven goal scorer. Yeah, look, the, the Isaac one for me, I, I think it is more potentially 32 games last season in the league, only scored six goals. But then you look at his Swedish appearances, 10 appearances, four goals. So he does have a bit of quality. And I'm seeing, I've seen him play for Sweden once or twice and I wasn't overly impressed for him, but you've got to look, you know, scrape beyond the the surface of this. And this is a player coming in that I don't think is going to start. I think he's going to be back up to Callum Wilson. I, I'm not sure how how bad Callum Wilson's injury is. And yeah. for for Newcastle to be able to say our number one striker's injured, let's go spend sixty million on a backup. It just goes to show you the strength of it. And listen, I, I think Trippy are damn born. I think they got damn born for eight million from Brighton, which is an absolute steal. And that that boy would put his head in front of a train for you. He has no fear. He would do. You need. Well, he went off with like a concussion last week as well. As well, so it kind of proves exactly. the point. This is what you need. Yeah. You, you need players like that. Players that you know it. It's bread and butter. We do not concede today. He goes out there not thinking, not wanting to score goals. He goes out there wanting to make goal saving challenges and people like that with. with uh, Gamarez as well Botman as well is really good the only bit of dodgy business for me and I, I say dodgy business with you know inverted commas because yeah. it was more it, it it killing two pigeons with one stone going to get Chris Wood from Burnley I think they paid uh, over 20 million for him which which is a lot a lot of money especially when you think you know he's probably going to be restricted to League Cup games this season especially with Isak coming in as well so that's maybe the only time they threw that money around. But look, Burnley obviously didn't do very well from it. They got the money, but it really did hinder their their chances of staying up in the league. So maybe it was money well spent. It was, it's the only one I'd have a question mark over was the Chris, the, the Chris Wood transfer. Yeah, it's, it's a strange one because I don't think, when you look at Newcastle's business, I don't think you can assess it in terms of the way other clubs would. Like, if somebody goes and spends 20, 30 million on a player, you kind of think, oh God, maybe that's the guts of their transfer budget gone. Whereas from Newcastle's perspective, if Isaac doesn't work out for seventy million, like they've got another seventy million, they've got another hundred million, they've got another two hundred million that they could possibly throw at another player. Like this kind of stuff doesn't matter to them, and that's the paradigm that Newcastle are going to be operating in for the next while. Is that when you've got bottomless cash, where's the jeopardy? 
Exactly. This is it. But you know that this is like you say, Alexander Isak, uh, sixty million rising to seventy million. Are are they going to are the Saudi investors going to be really too annoyed if this doesn't work out? Like you say, they seem to have very big pockets and, and even bigger arms. So I don't think it. Where does it stop? You know, it, if if Isak comes in and gets injured in his first games, you know, touch wood, are they going to go out and buy another striker? I I think Newcastle, you know, f, you know, whatever about. You know the stuff off the pitch, where the money's coming from. I think the club is on an upward trajectory at the minute, and you know I, I really do think the sky is the limit. I think when Pep Guardiola is saying, you know, Newcastle is one of the new powers in the Premier League, you really need to stand up and and uh, take notice of it. And like I say, they got a draw to uh, to Man City and St James. It'd be really interesting now to see the top six go to St James, and because Newcastle will rise to it for them games. You know, I, I can see them losing the odd game here or there against the lower teams, you know, just a bit, a little bit of a lull here and there, but I really do expect them to raise their game against the big teams and cause some trouble. Yeah, I think they could be around the fringes of uh, European football. Speaking of European football, Shamrock Rovers have just taken the lead at home to Ferenc Varos. They're into the final minute or so there. Andy Lyons nodding home from a corner from close range. So they'll go into the group stages of the Conference League the draw for that taking place tomorrow with their tails up for sure a 1-0 win it looks like it will be at home to Ferenc Varas we'll get Steve-O for a full time on 90 minutes here but we should mention two Linfields have gone to extra time at home to RFS of Latvia still scoreless at Windsor Park tonight still 2-2 on aggregate seven minutes in to uh, extra time up there in Belfast you touched on the Carabao Cup there Keith and I know Chris Wood started for Newcastle last night I think a lot of Irish eyes are kind of scanning through Carabao Cup lineups now uh, in a way that they never have done before. And with every just cause last night, judging by Brighton, because Evan Ferguson getting a start at 17 years of age at Brighton is story enough in itself. He set up the first, he scored their third in a 3 0 win away to Forest Green and is gaining rave reviews from people in the know. And as we were talking about later on, whatever about his nationality 17 year olds don't break through into first team football as a rule that much anymore unless you're pretty damn good the word in the grapevine seems to be that he is as you know damn good as it comes for 17 year olds it's quite the story already it is it's it's a great story and you know I hate I hate highlighting young fellas like this because I feel like I've been in this sort of position where you're coming through and there's, there's pressure building on your back and you're starting to get noticed but everything I'm hearing about him, he's the one who really impressed me over, over the Carabao Cup the last two days. Scored his goal, set one up. You know, that, everything, it's it's against Forest Green, not not a huge, you know, a huge club by any means, but he's still, he's only 17, he's playing men's football. You know, there's something on the line here that people will be putting in some, you know, really stiff tackles, especially Forest Green players when there's a, a Premier League uh, team coming to town. So for a 17-year-old to be able to stand up there and do well, you know, whatever about him playing well last night, I'm he- I'm hearing really good things about him as a human being. I'm hearing he's humble, he's level-headed, he wants to walk, and I've heard Graham Potter talk about his movement as well, and he's a really good finisher. So if he can stay humble and stay hungry, you know, the sky really does look to be the limit for this lad. And I I don't say that easily because, like I said, I don't like uh, shoveling pressure onto these young lads' shoulders, but you know, he does look really good. He- Talent-wise, he looks to have all the tools and. You know, mentally, he looks to be able to cope with it as well. So there's, I know Graham Potter thinks an awful lot of him. And Graham Potter would be a manager whose opinion I, I would really, really listen to because he's such a humble, down-to-earth guy that I think he doesn't like, you know, bringing these lads too too early, too early, too soon, too early. So, you know, it, from what Graham Potter's saying about him, from what I've seen, Evan Ferguson is the one. And let's not forget... Uh, Costello at Burnley as well. I think sure. he might he might find his way into the into the into the into the Irish fold soon. The Derek Oslo one's interesting because he wasn't I don't think considered really a first team player, and Vincent Company took a shine to him from a pretty early jump. Was in the starting eleven if I remember right in the opening game of the season and has been involved since then. Um, the word is though he's he's another one that we should keep an eye on. As you mentioned there, he won't be far off if he continues on this upward trajectory. Yeah, like, like you, Richie, I've seen him against Huddersfield on the opening day of the season. He, he played on the right of a tree up front and he looked really good going forward. He knew where to be. He was in the right positions at the right time. A little bit technically naive, defensively a little bit naive as well, but look, he's still really, really young lad. And when you've got a player like or a manager like Vincent Company coming in the door and he takes a shine to you, it just lifts you because you know 
this guy's won everything there is to win in terms of domestically with Manchester City and captain such a big a big dressing room had to deal with so many egos so when somebody comes in like that and gives you a vote of confidence says, yeah I'm having you as a player I really like you it just makes you feel 10 feet tall so I'm expecting uh, some decent things from Dara Costello as well there's, there's been quite the journey for a couple of players when you look at Dara Burns obviously scoring for MK Dons in the week as well Killian Phillips the trajectory he's been on from this time a year ago starting for drugs in the League of Ireland to starting like if you're a long rangey midfielder and you're being picked in a first team by Patrick Vieira you kind of have to figure you're doing something right you know and, and seeing him starting for Palace the other night as well and what's a really good and competitive Palace midfield that speaks volumes I guess of the progress he's making too Exactly, yeah, and to be coming in the building every day and just looking across as you're having your breakfast, seeing Mark, uh, I was going to say Mark Hughes because that, that that's my example. I used to look across for having me breakfast at Mark Hughes when he was the Blackbone manager to be looking across at Patrick Vieira and you're going to learn from these guys and there was times when Mark Hughes would join in in the shooting, tra- in the crossing and finishing sessions and you're just looking back and going, this guy is just world class, he's still losing it and I'm sure there's times when Patrick Vieira gets his boots on and, and joins in every now and then and They'll just, they'll just be feeding off it, learning from it, and just be a sponge. That's all he can be, is be a sponge, taking as much as you can, because, you know, the, the story is brilliant, going from Drotada over to Crystal Palace is it's an amazing story, and, you know, long may it continue. Listen, there's plenty more that we could probably get to, but time's against us. Keith, thanks so much for joining us this evening. Anytime, Rich. No worries. Football on Off the Ball, of course, brought to you by Sky. All the football you love in one place across Sky Sports, BT Sport, and Premier Sports. Across the Tallis Stadium we go because the full time whistle is gone there. Shamrock Rovers ending their Europa League campaign on a high. They'll drop into the Conference League draw tomorrow. And a great end to the game tonight, Rovers, for Rovers, Stephen Doyle. Yeah, a bit more late drama, Richie, as it was in that uh, last tie against Luda Goretz. The Rovers taking the win against the Hungarian champions, Ferenc Farosh. It was a goal set up by Jack Byrne, who just before had slipped a brilliant ball through to Andy Lyons, and it was saved by Bogdan, the former Bolton Wanderers goalkeeper. But the corner coming out of that then, it was Jack Byrne once again pulling the cross in. Andy Lyons jumping up to head it into the back of the net to give Rovers a 1-0 lead, and that's how it finished. It's his seventh goal this season.